I think discipline is a key to everything. Cause I'll tell you, like you can give somebody the solution that I do it all the time. We've come up with a solution to the problem, give them a routine, yeah, give them a yeah. process, a strategy, and they don't stick with it. And they're like, oh man, I'm back here again. It's like, well, you didn't follow through. It's important to have spontaneity in your life. You don't want to become rigid, yeah. but I'm disciplined for the fact that I'm doing the things I know will perform, will provide me with the best output, the best outcome. And they also move you out of emotional thinking into the ability to where I can go execute at a higher level. Okay. Hi, Brett. Thank you so much for joining me and, and for showing up today. Can you please just give us a bit more insight into yourself? What brings you here uh, at this point in your life and tell us a bit about your work? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Real, uh, real great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, just a little quick background on me. Basically, I have been a life coach and business coach for over two decades, 24 years this year, which is pretty incredible. Um, but to put it simply, to make it easy, because, you know, it's like, what does a life coach do, right? Um, I really look at myself as like a peak performance coach. The reason I say that is I think it helps people understand what I'm really specializing in doing, which is helping people to several things, but most importantly, understand what you need to do to be performing at your best in your life. And not just in general, but I work with clients in each area of their life. So it's a really holistic approach. So we're looking at your career, your relationships, your health and fitness, your personal growth, your spirituality, and your hobbies. Because I found after doing this so long that a lot of people would come to me for business coaching and they would just focus on their business. And that would be going great and we'd scale their company and then their health was falling apart. Uh, or they had no more relationship. You know, they're in an argument with their partner and things are falling apart. It's like, this doesn't work. So I help people really create design what I call the ideal you, which is a map of your life, how you want it to be. So you have a clear vision for the future that you're inspired by. You can see all the benefits from, you can step into that reality and see how that provides you with fulfillment and excitement. But then each day we focus on peak performances. How do you show up each day? How do you show up to be the best version of you each day? And that's the key because, you know, the goal could be two years, three years down the road. And you want to make sure that every day of the journey is fulfilling and that keeps you the healthiest mind, body, and spirit and performing at your best. Yeah, great. Thank you. And it's not always the case, but oftentimes people like yourself get to these places as a result of their own journeys and their own kind of ways of figuring these things out yourself. But can you, however much you want to share, can you kind of help us understand how you personally got here, like through your own journey? Sure. Yeah. You know, when it's, uh, it's, it's a long one. I could, I could make a trilogy <laughs> or a, a three part trilogy with all the episodes before. Right. But, um, yeah. to put it simply, I say that, you know, number one, the thing that really got me here was I, I believe what I'm doing is my calling. I really do know. We hear people say that, but I've heard people say that yeah. thought in the past, you know, like, Oh, it's kind of strange. I'm like, Oh man, but I really feel called to do this now. Like stuff that sometimes I don't want to do, right. You're like, Oh, I'm tired. And it's like, no, get up and do this thing. You're being called to do it. Or you try to shut the door on it and just keep showing back up. Like, okay, I get it. God, this is my path. So I do yeah. feel blessed that I'm doing what I was meant to be doing here, that I've always had this kind of in me. And there's always been a sort of a version of who I am. That's just evolved and layers have peeled off and there's been refinement. But so I've always been very faithful, been a very spiritual person. So I've always felt this this connection to God and felt this desire to help people and to be a better, to have integrity, to work through life mm -hmm. with integrity. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I was blessed with two amazing parents. They're my best friends. They're incredible people. So as a child, you know, when things would happen, like there'd be a, an incident at a school or somebody like a president would get shot or some war or something break out. We sat down as a family yeah. and said, let's talk about this. How does this make you feel? What is, mm -hmm. you know, what is that like? Um, what are your feelings on it? And it gave me a voice. And so for a very young age, I felt it was okay to express my feelings and I felt it was okay to understand what's going on and communicate what I felt. And instead of it being reactionary, we talked about it and would talk through how can you, how's that benefit you? How's that good for other people? I think that was a real blessing. So it gave me confidence. It gave me a voice at a young age. So based on that, I started going, um, you know, just, I, I was very into entertainment when I was younger, probably because the confidence made me want to do that. You know, and so like I mm -hmm. love doing theater and doing plays and doing commercials and television, all this kind of stuff. And I thought I was going to go that route. And I really thought that was my interest. At the same time, I was really learning a lot about psychology and behavior. And I was starting to work with companies and doing things and doing sales and training development. And the funny thing was they merged. But what I realized was the reason I liked the entertainment, I mean, it was fun when you're, you know, you're a kid and stuff, you do it's a great time. But really, I liked the psychology. It was somebody would give me a role and mm -hmm. say, figure out why this person acted like this. 
it was really what I do now. It's like somebody comes to me and they're the character, right? But it was just, I was getting a character that was like, you know, a two dimensional character in a book or in a play rather than a real person. And so I started to realize like, oh, my passion is di deciphering and figuring out reverse engineering, why this person behaved this way or why this happened this way. So I got really interested and dug into psychology and all the different things that have to do with behavior and communication. I love communication because it's really mm -hmm. how, we, how we translate what's happening in our own personal worlds. And so that was kind of like what led me into this process. But then my own personal journey, you know, I've gone through things I've had. I was married and went through a divorce. Um, I've had, I've lost my brother a couple of years ago, lost my grandmother a couple of years ago, had many great people around me. I was my ex-wife actually, when I met her, we were, I was 18 years old and she was 17. Her twin sister had just died a year before and it just wow. crushed her family. And I remember at 18 years old, stepping into this family and becoming the counselor for them because I'd want to see her and the family be fighting. And I would like, we're not going to go on a date. I'm not going to pick you up and go somewhere unless your family sits down and talks. So I would sit there at 18 years old with this family <laughs> and counsel them. And, um, you know, and it's just been, it's been a process of just moving myself out of the way, continually working on bettering myself, always finding a way to take mm -hmm. ownership for the things, mistakes I made and learn from them and being objective to look at other people and empathize with them and not judge anybody, but say, let me understand where they're coming from. And how can I either create an impact in their life or how can I get out of the way so it's not about me? And that right. journey went through working with people in insurance companies and restaurants and uh, mortgage companies and doing sales training and call centers and development, stuff like that. And as I went through the process, I realized quickly, it's, it's not about a product. It's always about the person. It's always about like what's going on here because somebody could be selling insurance someplace and they don't wake up in the morning and you're like, yeah, I'm going to sell insurance. You know, yeah. they may enjoy it, but they're probably waking up because it's going to pay their college bills or this can pay for their mom's medical bills. And so I really just started understanding about getting to the heart of the person and that when you do that, the real key is then figure out what their passions are in life. What are their dreams and how do you tap them into uh, an existence and a daily habit, a routine that allows them to stay focused on that, and not get overwhelmed by the stress of life? Yeah. Wow. Thank you. That was, that's um, insightful uh, for, for without using too many other words. And can you maybe just share a bit about how your own, so I often think when people like yourself that do the work that you do, if everyone could do it in some sense, you wouldn't have a job. So sometimes it sounds like this was somewhat true for you. Like you had that innate, I guess, capacity or gift to kind of do these kind of things and maybe how do you how do you cultivate that yourself on a daily basis like how do you take care of your mind body spirit on a daily basis i always think it's very helpful for yeah. people to hear how other people do it yeah great question well you know i'll tell you this like you know uh i think if i were to distill it back i think that the confidence my family put in me first is what gave me gave me the persistence and the resilience to develop discipline in myself. I think right, discipline yeah. is a key to everything. Cause I'll tell you, like you can give somebody the solution that I do it all the time. We've come up with a solution to the problem, give them a routine, <laughs> yeah, give them a yeah. process, a strategy, and they don't stick with it. And they're like, Oh man, I'm back here again. It's like, well, you didn't follow through. You know, we gave you something yeah. said stick with it for 30 days. And you did it for like four and you fell off and they didn't go back. And so the discipline is a real key. And so I would say for me, the factor, one of the things I'm most grateful about is my passion and my discipline. My discipline's incredible. If I find out something is good for me or I can change something, I do it and it's done forever. I'll cut it out immediately and never touch it again, or I'll start it today and do it forever. And so um, I have a very disciplined daily routine. Now I do say this, uh, it's important to have spontaneity in your life. You don't wanna become rigid, yeah, yeah. but I'm disciplined for the fact that I'm doing the things I know will perform, will provide me with the best output, the best outcome. And um, they also move you out of emotional thinking into the ability to where I can go execute at a higher level. If I'm changing my routine and I'm stressed, I'm worried all the time and trying to figure out what I'm doing and questioning things, it's a lot of bandwidth. It just wears you down. And then there's not much left to do the creation, the inspiration, the work you really want to do. So for me, I'm so disciplined because I know like when I keep this like this and I run this this way, this moves us out of the way, the fuel is saved. And now I really got a big tank to work on things. So I get up every morning at 530 in the morning. I, I've gotten up early my whole life. Um, I love to get up and watch the sunrise. So I get up and watch the sunrise every morning. First thing I do is I sit down and I do, um, I first sit down and observe myself. So I take a couple minutes and I just sit in peace. I have like a little temple here I come to that's like my place of serenity. And I just observe where my thinking is, where my breathing is. And then I actually do some breath work. 
I'll do several, you know, 10, 15 minutes of breath work and kind of regulate myself through it. Then I'll do some meditation. And then I have a process, a daily routine that I teach my clients that I call QP1 or quantum programming. And it's a process of programming your mind every day to how you want to be. Basically checking the boxes to make sure it's like checking all systems, all systems go right on a plane before you take mm -hmm. off or something. Mm -hmm. So I run through my passions, which are the most important things to me in my life to remind me who I am, what I'm doing, how I want to do it to be most fulfilled. And I really meditate into those things so that it can touch me and it sets the course and it sets kind of like it inspires me and gets me in the right mindset. It activates everything that's important. Go through a list of affirmations, you know, refining myself and focusing on who and what and how I need to do things in order to, to achieve that reality. And then I go through a list of gratitudes. So I move out of the headiness and the ego and move into my heart and remember to go out in the day being grateful and grounded and thankful for the opportunities I have and the people that have done so much to get me where I am. But then after that, yeah, I head right in and it's cold plunge time. Three minutes, yeah. freezing cold. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and I, I, honestly, I love it. I'm addicted to it now. But you know, you hear about this all the time. It's so crazy. But it's, you know, I'm like everybody else. I get up and there's mornings where I'm like, I don't want to do it. I woke up a couple of days ago and I woke up and I was like, ah, oh, stretch. I was like, nope, <laughs> I'm not doing this today. <laughs> It's like, I want to go back to bed. I'm tired. I was like, nope, you know, you got to do this. doesn't matter what you're feeling. Cause you know, I always say that feelings don't dictate reality. They dictate your personal reality. And so I was like, my personal mm -hmm. reality is that I won't be doing this today and you're just fine. So I did the routine, got up, went, got the cold plunge. As soon as I came out, I was yelling, pumping my fist in the air on fire, took my dog on a run and felt phenomenal. And I was so grateful that I didn't stay in the bed, but it's that discipline to say, I may be telling myself this or feeling this, but get up and do it. And so that's kind of my routine. And after I do the cold plunge, then I take my dog on a run. Then we usually, I go to the gym and work out for a little bit. And I listen to audio books. So I try to get, take mm -hmm. care of myself in the morning. I'm, it's my sacred time between 5.30 and usually like 9.30 um, every morning. Like it's just, you know, the morning routine, the breath work, the meditation, the cold plunge, the exercise, listening to audio books, um, just filling my tank. And then after that, I'm here for the rest of the world. I have all the energy. There's nothing left that I need to do for me. And I can be fully present for others. Nice. Yeah. That's such a nice reminder of you hear the silly cliche all the time, put your oxygen mask on before you help your, yeah. um, your neighbor or whatever, but it really is true a lot of the mm -hmm. time. And I think sometimes we forget that. Can you, one thing as you were talking that really resonated with me, which, which is certainly a barrier or, or something I struggle with is that that emotional reactivity uh, and how that influences my discipline or my decisions or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. right now I could lose some weight. <laughs> so I have been able to go to the gym. So I've been really good about that lately. Uh, I also have some sort of chronic back issues that have been really good lately. So when that's not a problem, I start playing hockey again and whatever. But the thing that I really still struggle with is my eating. Mm -hmm. And it's no doubt emotional, <laughs> emotional eating. And like, I just, so maybe we can use me as a guinea pig. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm just kind of curious how you help people with that. And maybe, and maybe we can use me as a guinea pig here. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great one. Um, so here's a couple things what I would say is it definitely is like stress. And then we get yes. into habits. There's the stress external that's causing, you know, external stress is the things in life. And then the internal stress we create from that. So we start to tell ourselves a narrative, a story, and we start to yeah. look for food as comfort, or we start to do it habitually. And also some of the habitual foods we do in our routine of what we eat, like we build candida in our stomach. And so it actually is a, it's a, it's a life force. It's its own being, you know, we've got, we have mm -hmm. millions of biomes in our body. And so yeah. that food source actually craves stuff. So it's like a little kid that wants to eat all the time. So you put a kid in your no stomach doubt. and wants to no eat, so it's really not yeah. even you anymore. Yeah. So that's the gut yeah. health, right? Yeah. 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 And so a couple of things I say to do, they're really good with helping. This will work with anything, but it's specifically with yours. Um, first of all, our emotions are a signal. And this is something when we learn this, it really transforms your life. So I always say like, you know, think of your mindset as just two things to make it really simple. You're either emotionally thinking or you're objectively thinking. And objective is clear. Like you can tell me there's no emotion on it. It's like, this is good. This is bad. This is why I would do this. It's very logical. But when you come to emotional thinking, it's not logical. It changes and moves and wishes and like, you really can't put anything on it. But the thing about emotions, they're, they're brilliant. They're a gift from God. They are our internal navigation system. But most of the time we feel angry and we feel we want, we're embarrassed about it or sad and don't want to talk about it. So we repress emotions. 
instead of looking at the signal, the signal is telling you there's something you need to do right now and there's something you need to learn. And so every time it happens, like this is an opportunity for growth. That's something I've embraced that has changed my life. So I don't run away from emotions. When they come up, I've trained myself to be able to step out and witness the emotion and go, oh, this is happening for a reason. Let me learn something. So I would give you this kind of, I'll give you this kind of two-step process to do. First thing you do is whenever you feel any emotion, this can be anger, sadness, fear, guilt. It can even be anxiety or a desire to eat or do something, a trigger or a behavior you don't want. <laughs> yeah. What you want to do yeah. is you have to recognize it first and go, okay, you know what? I have this uh, technique I call take five and come back better. And it works when you're trying to get out of a negative mindset and it works when you're trying to break a bad habit. So let's say that you're at home, you get anxious and all of a sudden you want to go eat food or you're sad, you're frustrated and we go for comfort food. What you do is you say, mm, you know what? I'm going to take five. Before I do this, I'm going to step away because what's happening is when you're emotional and you're not getting the signal is you're reacting. You're not being proactive. You're not making a decision. You're letting this pull you mm -hmm. and feel like you have to do it like an addiction. So the minute yes. you feel this craving yes. come on, you say to yourself, mm, you know what? I'm going to take five minutes. You go outside, you go someplace else. You have to change the environment. That's step one. doesn't matter where you go, yeah, but you want to yeah, change the environment. Yeah, get yeah. out of the kitchen, get out of the living room, go sit in your porch. <laughs> That's where, yeah. Sorry, I want to interrupt you. That's exactly where it is. I'm in the kitchen or the living yeah. room. Like, like that's probably, or, you know, sometimes it's like, I'll be out in the world or whatever, but generally it's in that exact yeah. environment. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. where Sorry to interrupt you. I just close, had to, close proximity, yeah. Proximity, right? You can see yourself, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you got to get up and leave that environment. And, yeah. you know, it's good you go outside for a minute, get some fresh air, but you can go anywhere you want that's separate because there really is an energy in a space. And so yes. step outside. Then what you do is sit down and you're going to breathe for a minute. You're just going to breathe. And like I suggest doing this breathing technique, this is a really simple one. We'll do some more in a minute, but this is an easy one that anybody can do. It's called four, two, six. It is a inhale for four seconds in your nose. So hold it for two seconds at the top and then exhale for six seconds. We'll do like a couple more of those. You can feel it. So inhale for four, hold it. And exhale. I'm going to do one more. Inhale for four. Hold it. And exhale. As you do that, what happens is your body begins to settle. You start to take control and manage your physiology, which affects your psychology and you become calm and you're able to separate yourself from the emotion. If you're angry or sad or something like that, it will process the emotion. Because again, once you get the signal, your body's like, okay, I got the signal. The breathing tells it, you can send the signal away. I'm aware of what you were trying to tell me. I've, I've made an, a change in my navigation. And so you process it through that breathing, the 426. All of a sudden you don't feel angry anymore. You don't feel as much of a craving anymore to go do whatever you're gonna do. Then you ask yourself these two questions. Number one, how is this helping me? And the second question how is, is the, how sorry, is this sorry, how is like yeah. the emotion or the, yep. yeah, whatever okay, this yeah. thing is like for you, if you're having the craving and you're like, oh, I'm going to go yeah. get some, I'm going to go get some chips and we get some Doritos out yeah, of the yeah. counter. I get that yeah. thing, you have a soda yeah. and Doritos. You breathe yeah. and you go, how is this helping me? How is going and having Doritos and drinking a Pepsi right. helping right. me? And right. your mind's like, well, it's not, you know, you kind of come like, okay, so that's question number one, you know, yeah. maybe you're angry and you're with somebody and it's like, uh, you're arguing with them. You step aside, like, okay, I just keep belittling them or cutting them off and not listening. How is this helping me? How is arguing with right. my partner helping me? And your mind will be like, it's not, you know, or maybe it tells you it's getting you out of a situation where you're being offended. Sometimes it's protecting you, you know, you'll get yep. the clear yep. answer, yep. but then you say, what am I supposed to learn from the situation? That's question two. So what am I supposed to learn? I'm supposed to learn that every time I sit around and don't go to the gym, I end up eating poorly. Or every time I get stressed at work, I go do this thing. So mm -hmm. you, you're able to understand and remove the triggers, or you're able to go do some like, let's say you're angry with the partner. What, what's teaching you is how's it helping me? Or what am I supposed to learn? I'm supposed to learn that I need to be more patient. I need to learn that I'm not being a good listener. And I need to start listening. And when I listen, we have more effective uh, conversations together, right? More valuable conversations. And so part of that process, what's that doing for you, Mike, is like, again, 
you're allowing your body to slow down for a minute. So you're kind of taking over managing control of it. So it's not a reaction that you're having. Then as you calm with the breathing, it tells a signal that it can dissipate. So your body's like, oh, I've got the signal. Then you actually move from the emotional part of the brain. When you ask yourself a question, a logical question, how is this helping me? You turn on different centers, different neural pathways in your mind that it has to turn off the emotion and go to solving a problem. And then through the process of working to solve the problem, you're reinforcing being in that thought pattern. And so all these things move you out of that behavior. And after you do it multiple times over and over, it starts to change it to where even when you just start to recognize like, oh, I need to take five, your body's like, oh, great. I'm going to feel good in a minute. And it's already, it's right. leading yeah. you there because yeah. it knows what's going to happen. Plus you're getting the information of how, how is this helping you, what you should be doing. So you're getting your action plan. And if you act on that plan and actually take those steps, you will start changing your life. You'll like, I have couples that argue all the time, people that have addictions, um, you know, people are going through depression, anxiety, and they do this stuff within a week or so. They're like, wow, it's amazing. I'm not doing this anymore. And they start catching themselves, self-detecting. Because I always say really important, you know, discipline's important thing. And then also being able to witness your own experience. So when something happens, like I'll get angry. And as soon as I get angry now, a split second later, I go, I go, oh, and like all of a sudden my mind's like, oh, wait, look at this. It's like, oh, you just clenched your fists. Your jaw just tightened. Your temperature went up two or three degrees. My mind starts being like, oh, I'm going after him. You know, you start yeah. to notice like, man, that thing made me change all these things about myself quickly. But if I can observe it, I can go, okay, that's fine. So apparently this is something important I need to work on. I'm not going to go grab something, break it. I'm not going to go road rage. I'm going to go, mm -hmm. I need to work on this. This is really important. So I just take that signal as if somebody's like yelling at you, stop or duck. And it's like, this is a warning. And then I go do the work, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And that's very nice and clear. And and it's coming up in my own, or it does come up in my own head often, but I also know it comes up in other people's minds too. How, when the resistance or what's sort of typical resistance that people have in those processes or that they ask you to help them through kind of, I don't want to do this right now, or this is stupid or almost like a shutdown kind of thing where mm -hmm. you just can't access that awareness. I guess something like that. Um, what are some common struggles, I guess, that people have and, and how do you help them with that? Yeah, it's great. You're, you know, number one is saying don't have the time. You know, people will, a lot of times like don't have the time. I'm so busy. And I say a couple of things that number one is how do you not have the time to better your life? Right. It's like people, people tell me I'm so unhappy. Like I'll say, you know, what would make our work together? successful for you? What would make this, a, yeah. you know, something that you'd be happy about, be fulfilled by? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm unhappy with my life. I don't like my career. My relationship is going, my health's terrible. I'm unfulfilled. And I'll say, okay, let me give you a little 10 minute technique to do. And they go, I don't have time for that. <laughs> and I'm like, you, you told me you hate your life. You don't even know how you're going to go on, but you don't have time to make 10 minutes for it. So it's really just BS, unfortunately. And we have to yeah, just get over the yeah. bad behaviors. There's another bad emotional thinking behavior we haven't trained. So right, I just kind right, of help people right. understand, re-educate you to look. At the beginning, it's gonna be tough. You're not gonna go up and hit a home run. You just gotta keep showing up. So it's not about doing it perfect, it's about showing up. Again, the discipline, show up, show up, show up. Don't even worry about the fact if you do something and you forgot to do it and later you remembered, that's good because you're starting to change that behavior. It's your pattern mm -hmm, interrupting. Mm -hmm. You're changing the pattern of what you did before. Right. So number one, yeah. people say they don't have enough time. And I tell them, number one, that's BS. Number two, the thing is, is what I'm teaching you is going to show you how to become so much more efficient with your life that you're going to have so much time. It's going to blow your mind. Like very soon, if you do the things that I coach my clients through, you're like, wow, I can teach you an hour long morning routine when you didn't think you had five minutes. And all of a sudden you'll do that yeah. hour long routine and your entire day will be organized and you'll be done early and everything happens smoothly and you're getting better results. So it's like, you know, if you make the time for yourself to do the practices you need, it transforms how you experience life and the results you get. So you're not going out and creating more mistakes and collateral damage and spending your whole day like, I hate what I'm doing. You'll start being inspired by your life. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, you know, when we're in these situations, sometimes, like you said, you know, like what are, what are people's resistance to it? They feel that something yeah. isn't going to work. And I try to help them understand that it's just a little shift in how we are approaching our life and approaching the problems. So it's not that the problem is so big. It's that we've created a narrative, a story that this is how things are. And as we begin to dissect it and look at there's other ways things can be, the minute you see an option, there's optionality, it starts to loosen up that problem. So like, could you imagine? So I give them different um, scenarios 
right? Could you imagine what it would be like if you weren't doing this thing? You know, what would right, it be like right. if you continued to do this thing? And so if they're doing that, we, again, we change that, that solid a limiting belief that's been created, that narrative that helps people shift. And I think that's a really important big one so that you show up when you need to be there. And again, things go into your mind that you don't realize unconsciously. So if you just have the intention of doing it, it will start to work. But people sell themselves out of it and tell themselves, I can't do it. It's not going to work. And that's the bad thing. So we have routines. Again, with that morning routine, we start to reinforce with affirmations and things. Statements we say that start programming our mind. So you may not believe it at this moment, but you're putting a healthy suggestion in that soon will be there because you're repeating this new story, right? Because you've got to get rid of this one that's playing all the time. you got to override yeah, it with something yeah. new. Yeah. Nice. And and I, I like, I love that you use the word suggestion. I don't know if this is exactly what you meant, but oftentimes, and I love people's kind of bullshit detector uh, where this idea of false positivity. So it's not that we're, we're not giving ourselves some BS story, right? Of everything's going to be great and blah, 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 blah. Can you just kind of talk to that a little bit and how you see that come up and, and talk to people, yeah. talk to people through that? Yeah, I'd yeah. love to. And that goes right into what my process is, you know? So like basically what happens when I, when I work with people, like I tell them like, you know, if anybody ever tells you, I can tell you everything to do, I've got all the answers for you. They're full of it. Um, I yeah. am one of the best <laughs> puzzle solvers in the world. So what I do is I help people when they come to me, figure out what they need to do and then help them recognize when right. they're not doing it. I'm not like, oh, hey, Mike, I got all right, your right. answers, but I can help you figure yeah. them out. I can help you figure out things about yourself you've never understood before. And so the first thing we do is I help my clients discover their passions, which is these unconscious drivers. It's not just like, oh, I love to play the guitar. It's exactly yeah. how you play the guitar, when you play the guitar, what it means for you, the fulfilling. It's very niched. And then we we go through a process of organizing those things that are important in your life and prioritizing them so that you're focusing on the top five things. And my point for saying this is when you understand those things, they become the filter in which you run your entire life through the decisions you make, the goals you have, the relationships you have, everything you do is a factor of how does this fulfill this passion or how am I living this passion or how is this working with it? So you can build that path. Once you have that in place, you know, why you're doing what you're doing, where you're going, what your ultimate goal is, and what fulfills you each day in every area from your career to relationships, et cetera. So once you have that vision, then what we do is we create affirmations. This is what you're talking about here. The affirmations are what you need to be, do, and have in order for that to become reality. If you want to become the number one jazz or blues guitarist in the world, and you want to do it because you want to take that money to help impoverished children in city, inner city areas where they don't have access to certain things, it's very specific. Well, you're going to need yeah. to be a certain type of person. You got to like, who's that person have to be? You have to be an advocate. You have to be patient. You have to be charitable. Someone that cares, that's empathetic. What do you have to do? You have to da, 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 da. What do you need to have? I need to have these different degrees or the successes or connections. And so the affirmations that we create are just programming you to become that person that needs to go on that journey, right? It's like if you were to say to somebody like, who, who do you think should be the president? Everybody has a different opinion, but you could go through a list of, I think the president should be somebody who is like this. You can list the characteristics. Right. This is what I want my president to be like. Okay, that's how you see a president. So we have to get clear on who you want to be. And then we have to develop that character and say, this is how that person gets there and behaves. It's the only person that can be that person. And so you're not BSing yourself. You are getting specific for the first time, because most people don't know what they want. I can stop most anybody anywhere and say, what are you most passionate about? What do you want in your life? Where are you going? What do you need to change? And they can't give me answers. And so that's okay. Cause again, it's emotional thinking. They become stressed, worried. I'm going to get it wrong. I don't know. But when you get specific, you remove the emotions, you get clear on the goal. And then it's about execution instead of questioning your decisions. Instead of saying like, what should I be doing? You're like, how should I be doing it? And so right. we yeah. reprogram yeah. your mind by understanding the steps you need to take, the action items, and then building them. And the more you know them, the easier it is to get to them. And then you understand each day, like what I need to do or how I'm off track. Like if I'm supposed to be this, I'm not this. It's like, maybe I say an affirmation to myself. I have clients who are bad listeners and I'll have them start saying an affirmation that I'm a great listener and I'm constantly improving. Every day people are thanking me for doing such a good job of hearing them truly. And at first you're not it, but it reminds you, get out there, Mike, and do this today. Be a good listener, you know? And so it becomes yeah, the, yeah, it's the yeah. guiding, it's your guiding light. Yeah. Thank you. And I wanted to ask you about, cause I don't think we talk about this 
very well sort of in our, maybe a, certainly more in the US uh, in certain parts of it, but the idea of, of God or higher power or spirituality, that kind of stuff, how, I guess sort of, you did talk about it a little bit, but how, how does that play into all of this for you or how do you help people uh, if they're open to it, I guess, or just come into relationship with that concept and then maybe maybe it's not um, doesn't fit exactly, but maybe just a little commentary on sort of the God shaped hole in Western society. If you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's a great question, Mike. So, you know, like I said, I've been very faithful my whole life. It's, you know, we go in and out of like our practices and how much it's um, a forefront of what we do. But I'll tell you in the past 10 years and absolutely in the past six years, it's become so much more the forefront of who I am. So most of my clients are high performing executives. You know, I got people making multi-million dollars running casinos here, big, large companies. I mean, I like, and so when I was doing this for a long time, I felt like I need to keep anything that has to do with spirituality or faith out of the conversation. Cause I feel like it doesn't, it doesn't belong here in business. Right. Then I started to realize one is I evolved my work. You know, because if you're somebody that pays attention to what you do, you're like, where's the gaps? Where do I need to improve? Where can I refine my work? So I was always leaning into things. Personally, that led me into more meditation and Buddhism and things for myself that that just practices of understanding spirituality, because I realized it was a gap for me. But also I started to realize that a lot of my clients, I mean, I have a client come to me making $20 million a year and I'll ask him, what would make this successful, your relationship? What do you want to get out of this? Oh, I'd like to double my money. I'd like to have more of my investments and scale my company. And it's like, but you just told me you're so unhappy with everything you're doing. And so <laughs> I started to realize not only in my work, but in their experience that within about a month and a half to two of working with me, they're like, you know what, Brett, the money doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. It's about impact. It's higher purpose. And so I realized that what happened was it's the accountability. It's no matter what you want to call it, it's getting outside of yourself, getting rid of the material and starting to look at something that starts becoming more divine. Like how, yeah, what legacy yeah, am I yeah. leaving? How am I impacting this world? What am I doing for my community, my family, the people I love? And so I started to realize that I need to lean into it more. And as I started to kind of just talk about or lean into my experiences, wasn't preaching it to me, but sharing what I was learning, people were jumping mm-hmm. at it and they needed it and yeah. wanted it. And they were all sharing with me that I've had a bad experience with the religion in the past. I grew up this way, or I've had this, or I never understood it. And so they felt uncomfortable. So the thing was the conversation wasn't being had. So what I realized was with my work was it wasn't about me going out and preaching to somebody. It was about giving a space where people felt comfortable to have this conversation and feel that it could be explored without somebody saying, oh, here's the box you need to get in right now. Let me get you in there and shove you in and make it fit. It was like, let's talk about what happened. Let's unpack it. Let's get rid of the trauma from the past and the limiting beliefs. And let's see if there's a path forward. And through that, my approach and my belief is, I believe that I'm here to do this. I think it's one of my highest callings is leading people to their spirituality. And sometimes people, again, they go, oh, but what I mean by that is not religion. I'm not saying run out and be a Baptist or a Catholic or anything like that. What I mean is, if you really peel back a couple things, to me, when you're home alone, when no one's there and you're by yourself, who are you accountable to? Because if you're just accountable to yourself, you're probably not going to do your best. You're going to cheat, you're going to lie, and you're going to let yourself off the hook. If you're accountable to something else, you're not going to be right. If you're like, I'm not going to cut that corner. I'm going to actually, I told my friend I'm going to do this. I'm going to sit down and do this. I told him I'm going to read their email or not. I'm going to sit down and read their email. My friend writing a book, I'm going to read your introduction. Instead of saying like I did and they just, oh, nobody's going to know, you do it Mm -hmm. because you have integrity and authenticity. And so there's a higher connection and accountability. Beyond that, come on, I, I love what people's ideas are, but really you think as brilliant as this world is that just something came from a bang boom. And like all this incredible, no chance. It's like, you know, nothing in the world happens that sequentially. It's too complex and beautiful and brilliant. And beyond that, to me, everything is really truly about love. It's about love. It's about um, empathy, caring for each other. It's about the unity. We are one global consciousness of one society, the animals, everything that's here. And when you harness that, you start to live with such a peace and such a, a love and a kindness in your heart that you live so differently. I have now coached hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands, but hundreds for sure of people through this dogma, this ideology of loving, being kind, having a higher accountability, just being a good person. When when it comes down to it, it's Mm -hmm. all the good things. Mm -hmm. Have integrity, be honest, care about people, listen, show up, give, be grateful. And when you do, I've watched them transform. I've watched them say, I've never been happier. They're good people going out and making a real impact in the world. And so that's what I really carry out to people is finding that 
love and feeling connected to the world around us. You're not alone. A higher accountability of being a better person and understanding that you do have a purpose. And here's the other thing I'll tell you, Mike, is, you know, I've learned about the power of surrender in the past five or six years. And it's so powerful because what we do is we create a goal and we tell ourselves we know everything, basically, because we want that goal to happen exactly how we wanted it or we're upset. It's like nothing in the world ever goes the way you want it to, right? Like nothing. So when you create something and you're frustrated because it didn't turn out how you want, I think it's laughable. I'm like, no, it's it's a guidepost. It's it's give me a direction in the night to know where to go. And so the thing is, when it doesn't happen or when I go along the process, everything is happening for me. It's either somewhere I need to grow and learn or it just works, right? Something goes along and it happens. Or you're like, no, I came against the wall. The relationship didn't work. The career opportunity didn't happen. You know what? If you surrender, I guarantee you something better comes along and you just grow. But most of the time, we are not listening to the signals we're getting from our emotions and we are not paying attention to the opportunities for growth that are guiding us through life. We're constantly fighting instead of being in the flow. And so I think in Western society, you know, you talk about the gap, kind of the hold that's here. Mm -hmm. I think what it is, is we become way too external. Everything is measured on money and it's measured on what you own. And the truth, and listen, I work with all those people. They come to me all the time, very successful, wealthy leaders. And the thing is, they're unhappy. They have everything you'd want on a piece of paper and they hate their lives until they make these shifts. And so um, I think to me, at the end of the day, I'd rather have peace of mind than a billion dollars. Because if I have a billion, I have no peace of mind. What, what is it? You're just chasing life, you know? So that's kind of my, that's kind of my little uh, yeah. soapbox on yeah. that. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and maybe can you just talk a bit about that idea of surrender and how mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get or, or maybe are just unaware of what that actually means. It doesn't mean that we're giving up agency or anything like that, right. uh, which I think is a common misperception or something like that. But mm -hmm. can you maybe just I know you did sort of talk about it a little bit, but any other thoughts or, or what that yeah, looks like? To in in a moment or in a yeah situation yeah you're right mike most people think of these things as inactivity i'm one of the most active people you ever imagine i call part of my company action mastery for that reason that's the thing we all need to do um, yeah. but surrender is not inactivity it is a perspective and it's a behavior so you're still behaving in it but what you're doing is so most people think surrender means just stop doing what you're doing give up and just let it all happen in order to surrender, you have to do the work first and have a plan. You have to develop a plan, a strategy like I'm talking about, have your vision for the future, know what you're passionate about. You need to have a daily routine where you are measuring your performance. You got the vision and you have how you show up each day. When you have those two components, because if you think about it, that's for everybody, that may be my process, but it boils down. It is right. Where the hell are you going yeah. and how are you feeling? How are you doing each day? Because that's what it is. So if you prove how you're doing mm -hmm. each day, you're going somewhere and then where are you going? But the thing is, once you have those things in place, you have to surrender to the process and say, I've done, I'm doing the best I can. And that's the best I can do. And just show up and say that if something doesn't work, it means that there's something I need to learn. Like I keep trying to make this, I keep arguing with my partner and trying to make this, this person doesn't want to be married or date me or I'm trying to make it work or trying to make it work. Or I'm trying to push this thing and make this project happen. That isn't happening. Right. It's the universe yeah. telling you there's something else to do right now. This is not the step. Right. Maybe sit back. Maybe don't push the proposal. Don't call the person again and try to get their business. Don't track that person down again and try to get that date or fix that thing. Sit back for a minute. Take a moment. I'll tell you, Mike, in 20 years of doing this, I've never had a single person tell me they should have gone faster. Nobody ever says that. <laughs> Everybody always says, yeah. <laughs> I should have taken my time. I should have slowed down. I should have thought through it more. So the surrender is an action item. But what you do is you surrender to the fact that what is happening is supposed to be happening and you do the things that come present. So rather than sitting down on the couch and saying, well, it's all going to come to me, I'm trying to get this proposal. I've got this business thing I'm doing. I'm trying to get somebody to invest in my company. So I'm going out and I'm doing meeting after meeting after meeting and no one is accepting and investing and I'm not getting anything. It doesn't mean that I sit down and go, okay, well, I'm just going to wait now for everything to come to me. What I say is, okay, the surrender is the way I'm doing this isn't working. The universe, God is telling me that pushing and fighting and trying to find another person and try to force this thing isn't working maybe i need to look at my proposal and shift the proposal maybe the propo the approach that i'm coming at is wrong maybe i don't need investment maybe i need to, to build this thing a different way that is the surrender is understanding that you're still going the right direction but you maybe have to change your strategy and also understanding that 
if it doesn't work, something else will come along. And the minute you surrender that I'll tell you, man, this is crazy, but the minute you surrender, things start to shift. You start to feel peace. You start to go, it's okay. I don't really need that thing. I'm feeling all right. And all of a sudden, a little bit later, an opportunity will show up that will, you'll go like, oh my God, that's the piece I need. I met that person now that I realized I didn't have the right yeah. CEO for the business. And there they are. Or my friend actually has a company that has a component that works with this. And now we're going to join. But when you're forcing it, you're just pushing a peg into a, into a place that doesn't work <laughs> and you just lose the time on it. And then you burn out your emotional bandwidth and you give up. But surrender means you're at peace with whatever's happening and it keeps you in a flow. You're learning and growing and experiencing and learning and growing and experiencing. Yeah, that was a beautiful description of all that. Um, Thank you. Okay. And, and yeah, that no, was really good. Uh, I. I often think, you know, from the sort of meditative perspective, it also sometimes it helps to think about it as like contraction and ease, which you sort of were describing, but like physiologically speaking, there's yeah. like contraction and ease. Yeah. At least that's sort of how I'm trying to learn a bit more or, or get in touch with what that is actually like. And I always go back to that scene in my living room or whatever, when I'm like anxious or frustrated or whatever, it's like food, food, food. Yeah. Surrender. Somehow I need to, <laughs> to, to enhance my ability to surrender there. Um, and, and okay. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes or any, so I, I want to maybe any other th particular things you want to make sure we talk about, and then maybe we could do another little breathing practice or something else that you think would be helpful. Yeah, actually, I'd like to go into that. We could do this together. So I'd love to share a little bit about, uh, the breath work because it's something I'm extremely sure. passionate about right now. And it's things I'm focusing on with my work, but also these are things I can impart right now. A couple simple things that anybody listening yeah. can use these immediately. And I guarantee you'll start to change your life. You're like, I cannot believe this is this simple and working this well. So yeah. let me give you a little bit real quick, kind of like a background of like the theory behind sure. the breath work. Cause I think once you understand this, this is what gets you invested in, in taking the, the dive and trying it. So, what most of us don't realize is, and this is things we've learned through science in the past several years, but most of us think that the way our mind thinks, like I'm stressed, so I've got all this stress in my mind and I'm negative. So therefore, because I'm stressed, I'm breathing a certain way. That's actually incorrect, which is kind of crazy. Um, what it is, is the way you breathe actually tells your mind how to think. So it goes in reverse. They've realized that there's millions of receptors in your lungs, and the way you breathe in, the quality of air, the speed and the rate of air that you breathe in, it sends a signal to your brain and says, this is how we need to think, or it turns on certain centers of your mind. So for example, let's say that you are out someplace and uh, something happens like, you know, a bear comes at you in the woods or a car almost hits you. What happens is we gasp, <gasps> take a big, or something, or all of a sudden, like, oh, like, so like you see a bear, like, oh, oh gosh, you know, or like something scares you. What that does is that huge gasp in that amount of air and the way it comes in signals the body, boom, fight or flight, adrenaline, cortisol, it kicks you into a state to be prepared to fight or to run. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you're going to go like, you're going to get like, you're going to jump into a cold plunge. You're going to jump into a river. You're going to do some kind of work, workout or something. What do we do? We pump ourselves up. We go, <laughs> and we do that to go, okay, it's time to pump up. Or if you go like, I need to calm down, we go, when we slowly, so we're actually kind of doing it, but we don't realize it. We're just not connecting that we have the power to do it. So the thing is, is when you manage your breath and you understand the different techniques you can use to manage your breath, you move yourself through a process of changing and managing your mind, controlling your anxiety, your creativity, your inspiration, your focus, etc. So here's a couple things to know about this. That's number one, you control your thinking with your breath. So when you manage your breath, you manage how you're going to focus or perform. The next thing is when we breathe, when you exhale longer than you inhale, you actually calm your body. So if you notice, like when we're exhausted, we sigh, a long sigh, like, mm -hmm. ah. that's because we're trying to calm our body down. So that's why I did the four, two, six. If you're breathing and inhaling for four seconds, but you're exhaling for six seconds, your body starts to settle. It's like you breathe in and then, it just settles the body and settles the body and settles the body and tells the mind it's time to relax and all the centers go and the fight or flight gets turned off in reverse. If you want to get activated, if you want to get pumped up for something, you do longer inhales and shorter exhales. So there's a technique I do called breath of fire where you just breathe through your nose and your mouth is closed and you just do short breaths like 
kind of blowing out and it activates your body because it's what your inhale happens just naturally as an uptake where you're just blowing out, blowing out, blowing out, blowing out. And it just charges you up with energy. And so it's really cool to know that if you ever need to do one or the other, exhale longer to calm down, inhale longer to, to power up. So those are kind of nice to do. So just remember that the exhale is, you know, it's kind of like your body too. If you let the air go down out of your mouth, it's lower than your nose and lowers you relax. If you pull it up in the nose, you're lifting yourself up and you're giving yourself energy. And so a um, couple things I like to do, and these are some techniques I can give people right now. And we'll do one of these together in a second. Yeah, let's do it. But this let's is what I would it. suggest you do. Everybody has a smartphone now. We have alarms and all these things in there. When you get done today, or when you're listening to this, put an alarm in your phone and set it so it says, you know, you can, you can call them with different names. You can title them, call it, check your breathing. And when, right now, set one for four hours from now. And in four hours, when that alarm goes off, stop for a moment and just pay attention to how you're breathing. Don't, don't regulate it. Just go, how's my breathing? And like, wow, notice it's shallow or whatever's going on. And then start to regulate it. You can do again that four to six. Inhale through the nose for four. Hold for two seconds. Exhale for six. Four, two, six. And if, then reset your alarm for four hours later. Do this two or three times a day for a week. And after two days, you're already going to change your life. But after a week, you're going to go, I, I guarantee you, your anxiety will be diminished or gone. Your focus will be incredible. Everyone around you is going to be like, what is going on with you? You're so calm. You seem so grounded. You seem, you'll also even look better because when you oxygenate your body, right, your blood flow, you look healthier. But we're giving, to, we overbreathe as a society. The average person does 20 to 30 breaths a minute. So that's an inhale, exhale cycle. They usually do 20 to 30 of those a minute when we need to be doing five to seven. So it's incredible how much over breathing we're doing, which you're over oxygenating your brain. And if you think about it, what's a panic attack? A panic attack is breathing too much, too much oxygen to the brain. Mm. <laughs> and so we're doing a level of a panic attack every day, all the time. So you got to kind of bring that back down so that you're in a healthy homeostasis. Okay. Those are some big things to do. Another thing you can do real quick here, just throw out a couple because people have the recording, they'll be able to listen to this yeah. and then we'll do one. Yeah. is you can set yeah. a timer on your phone for 60 seconds and just count your breaths. Inhale, exhale, one. Inhale, exhale, two. Kind of count how many you're doing in a minute. Write it down and then do another minute and adjust and try to do seven or eight breaths in a minute of a cycle. Inhale, exhale. And you'll see like you're sitting at 20 and the next wrap around you go and really slow the breathing down and try to get it to reduce seven, right? And you go, my God, I feel so, you can, so relaxed. You can lay down and sleep. And this mm -hmm. is somebody that's normally mm -hmm. anxious and can't even get to bed. Okay. So those are some really simple things. But what I like to do is we'll do a really short cycle here of something I do, which is I do this all the time. I do it several times throughout the day. There's a first technique, which is breath of fire. So again, what you're going to do is your mouth will be closed. You just breathe out your nose. And it's imagine if you had something on the end of your nose or on your finger and you're trying to blow it off like <laughs> so it's just sharp exhales and you, your stomach you want it to come from your diaphragm so your diaphragm is popping it shouldn't be like a it's a pop 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 strong breath the other thing is when you breathe you don't want to breathe up and down a lot of people do this with their shoulders going up your lungs should expand horizontally that's healthy breath it should be opening your lung capacity your rib cage Okay. So that's that breath. That is the breath of fire. Then we also have alkaline breathing, which is just inhaling through the nose deeply and exhaling out the mouth. So just in the nose and out the mouth, in the nose, but they're deep breaths. Like you want to feel the lungs fill up like as deep of a breath. Like if it was your last breath, you could take for a while. You're just so what we'll do is, and then we're going to do a breath hold afterward where we'll do this. I'll say like, it's like, Breathe in the biggest inhale and hold it. And we're going to hold it for a minute. And you can come out whenever okay. you want, but I'm going to have you hold as long as you can. Okay. So we're going to do okay. an alkaline for first. Then we'll go into, or so we'll go to the breath of fire, alkaline, and a breath hold. I'm going to guide you through it. So it'll be easy. I'll guide you through okay. the steps. I want you to okay. see what this feels like to do this process with me. Okay. So okay. we're going to start with breath of fire. And I'm going to count it first. So I'll kind of tell you how to breathe. So breath of fire is just the nose. So we're going to go breath, breath, breath. So it's, Sharp breaths blowing out, just breath, 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 breath. Try to make them sharp, strong, like you're trying to win an award for breathing the best way you can with this. Breath, 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 good. Keep doing that. Breath, 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 breath. Good, just 
keep it going nice pop in the stomach now we're going to go double time with this so you're going to do the same thing faster breath 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 and don't worry about getting it right just try to go faster breath 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 yeah good good breath 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 yep keeping it going now we're going to go to inhaling through the nose and out the mouth so in the nose and exhale big inhale exhale kind of pull it in fast like another big one another big one one more Now we're going to go double time. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Try to suck them in real fast and strong. Just nice. Keep going. A couple more. One more. And then taking a really deep inhale. Suck in some more air and hold it and don't let go now hold your breath what i want you to do is relax your eyes let them close i want you to let your shoulders drop relax the tension around your eyes the tension in your forehead let your face and your jaw relax let your neck just begin to feel at peace and start to go inward to your heart and just simply focus on your heart chakra for a minute. Think about living through that and feeling through it. You have so much oxygen in your body. You just oxygenated it. So you have so much more ability than we realize. And the thing is, a lot of times our monkey mind will go and say, I got to breathe. I have to let go. I have to do this thing. Just observe it. This is the practice, like meditation. Go like, oh, interesting. My mind is saying this. It's doing this. And when you observe it, you notice all of a sudden you're able to hold it longer. And maybe go a couple more seconds. And then in three, two, one, go ahead and take your recovery breath. And then take a real nice inhale again and in and hold it. Just, just hold that for a second. Let the shoulders drop. And a big exhale with a sigh. <sighs> now just keep your eyes closed for a second and do what I call a mountaintop breath, which are nice, deep inhales through the nose. And just let it fall out the mouth. It's like you came down on Thanksgiving morning and you smell turkey or apple pie or mm -hmm. on the top of a mountain, you're like, ah. <sighs> Nice. And now you can just come back and return to normal breathing. How's that feel? Yeah, it feels great. It feels Doesn't great. it? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And do you, is that sort of like a whole process that's suggested to do all like in sequence? Yeah, I do that. I have, yeah. so I have, um, I do these morning meditations every Monday morning, right? Everybody come on to Zoom and StreamYard, yeah. a bunch of streaming platforms. And I take them through a cycle of these and we do different variations. But I usually mm -hmm. do three rounds. I did a little bit shorter for us today, but I usually do yeah, three rounds yeah. of that. And I will usually do the uh, out, breath of fire, single and double. Then I'll do alkaline, single and double. And then I'll do a breath hold. And there's empty tank breath holds and there's full tank. We did a full tank where you fill up your lungs and hold it. Right, you right, can also, right. you breathe in, you exhale it all and then hold it there. And they do different things for helping you get used to the breath and kind of managing it through the body. But if you just do two or three rounds of that, you know, the alkaline or breath of fire, alkaline and breath hold, you're talking about maybe seven, eight minutes. And it's incredible. You'll realize like all yeah. of a sudden too, you'll start being able to breathe, breath, hold your breath a lot longer. I can hold my breath now so easily for like three minutes, like it's nothing. And you yeah. come out of it and you're like in a state of euphoria because what you're doing is you're actually resetting the hormones in your body, mm -hmm. turning mm -hmm. off the fight or flight. You just turned off your fight or flight mechanism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. adrenaline and cortisol that might have been in your body, any anxiety shuts off. 
it sets those signals in place. And so then you get more focus, opens your mind to creativity and just a bunch of great things. But, you know, I, um, people can follow me online and I have my YouTube channel. Uh, there's many places where you can find these and I have all these recordings of me guiding these breathwork journeys. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I was just going to ask, I know sort of we're at the end of our time. So I, people can find you on your website and all that stuff will certainly be included like in the show notes and, and whatever, when, when it gets published, but any other kind of reminders or pointing people towards something or, or yeah, how do people find you? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I would say is, so you can find me, obviously my name, if you search it anywhere, you're going to find everything, Brett Ballman and my website's brettballman.com. But what I would suggest doing is a couple things. Um, if you go to my website, there is a section on the top of the menu that says action mastery. Underneath that, I have tons of great resources. Every Monday, I do these free morning meditations. You can go in there and sign up and join them and watch the recordings. Um, I do free online breathwork journeys every other week, which are powerful, incredible. I'd love for you to come to one, Mike. I think you'd love it. Yeah, every I think I'm Tuesday. going to. Yeah, yeah. I'm cool. in. It's really <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. You can sign up on there. It just says breathwork journeys, and um, okay. they're an hour long. And then after we're done, I do a live Q and A and we talk about it and process it. But what I'd love for people to do is I have a, uh, I actually have a Facebook page. It's uh, my Action Mastery Facebook page. And so you can find this by going to anything or messaging me. But if you just go to Ash or mm -hmm. facebook.com forward slash Action Mastery Tribe, um, you can go there and there's so many resources. I do videos constantly, everything like this. I'll po post podcasts. I do breathwork journeys, tools, books a great place to find a good community and to be able to access these resources and to connect with me to find them. Amazing. Amazing. I am definitely going to join. Um, awesome. Monday probably is better for me than Tuesday, but uh, anyway, I will find a way to, to do that. And, you know, just again, Brett, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Maybe more helpful for me than it was for others, but I don't know. Uh, I assume, I assume not, but that was really great. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, keep up the great work. The world certainly needs, you know, people like yourself. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Real pleasure to be on. Really appreciate you. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out.